Hey guys, how's it going? Mr. Mitchell here. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the astrophysics topic of the Advanced Higher Physics course. Now, just before we look through the learning outcomes, remember you can download your own free copy of this document from my website, mrmitchellphysics.co.uk, so that you can tick off things as we go through it. So you should know that astrophysics is split into three key areas or subtopics called gravitation, general relativity, and stellar physics. And we're going to look through all three parts. So in section one, gravitation, it says that you need to be able to convert between astronomical units and meters and between light years and meters. So remember to go from AU to meters, you times by 1.5 times 10 to the 11. And to go from meters back to AU, you divide by 1.5 times 10 to the 11. And to go from light years to meters, you times by 9.46 times 10 to the 15. And to go from meters back to light years, you divide by 9.46 times 10 to the 15. And remember, one AU will be given on the data sheet in the exam, but one light year will not. So you need to either just remember 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters is one light year, or be able to derive it from speed distance time. The second point there says to define gravitational field strength as the gravitational force acting on a unit mass or the weight per unit mass. So that is just your definition of gravitational field strength. Then says to sketch gravitational field lines and field line patterns around astronomical objects and astronomical systems involving two objects. So remember, a single planet on its own will have field lines going in towards the centre of that planet because gravity is an attractive force. But if you've got two planets near each other and they have the same mass, then you'll see a kind of symmetrical pattern of field lines around the outside with a space in the middle. But if the two masses are not equal, remember you get a region in the middle of the gravitational field pattern where the gravitational forces cancel each other out. It then says to use an appropriate relationship to carry out calculations involving gravitational force, masses and their separation. So remember this is Newton's law of universal gravitation, F equals gmm over r squared. The next one says to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving the period of satellites in circular orbit, masses, orbit radius and satellite speed. So for satellite motion we can use F equals gmm over r squared equals mv squared over r, i.e. our gravitational force is equal to the centripetal force. And that is because, remember, the gravitational force provides the centripetal force. And another way of writing mv squared over r for centripetal force is we can write it as f equals mr omega squared for angular velocity omega instead. And we can say that this is equal to mr times 2 pi over t squared because, remember, omega equals 2 pi over t. So it's handy to remember that we can equate gravitational force to centripetal force when we're doing satellite problems. The next one says you need to be able to define the gravitational potential of a point in space as the work done in moving unit mass from infinity to that point. And remember we define infinity to be the point of zero energy, i.e. zero joules. You need to also know that the energy required to move mass between two points in a gravitational field is independent of the path taken, i.e. it's a conservative field or a conservative force. Because remember a conservative field is one in which the path that an object takes does not matter. Next it says to use appropriate relationships to carry out calculations involving gravitational potential, gravitational potential energy, masses and their separation. So for gravitational potential we have V equals minus gm over r and for gravitational potential energy all we do is take our gravitational potential and multiply it by our second mass small m so we get Ep equals V times m or in fuller terms that equals minus gmm over r. And remember the negative sign is due to the direction of the gravitational force and the fact that we define infinity to be at zero joules so anything closer than infinity will be negative energy. Next it says to define escape velocity as the minimum velocity required to allow a mass to escape a gravitational field to infinity where the mass achieves zero kinetic energy and maximum or zero potential energy. And remember a key number for that is around 11, 11.2 kilometers per second for an object trying to get away from the Earth's gravitational pull. Next it says to derive the relationship V escape equals the square root of 2gm over r. So you need to be able to derive that equation. And lastly for section one, it says use an appropriate relationship to carry out calculations involving escape velocity, mass and distance. So not only do you need to be able to derive that equation, you also need to be able to use it and apply it to questions. Section two now for general relativity says that you need to know that the special relativity deals with motion in inertial, non-accelerating frames of reference, and that general relativity deals with motion in non-inertial, i.e. accelerating frames of reference. It then says you need to be able to state the equivalence principle, i.e. that it is not possible to distinguish between the effects on an observer of a uniform gravitational field and of a constant acceleration 
and have knowledge of its consequences. So remember a consequence included the gravitational time dilation, where objects in stronger gravitational fields will have time that is slowed down. It then says to consider space-time as a unified representation of three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So remember we have x, y and z dimensions for space and the time dimension t for time. Know that general relativity leads to the interpretation that mass curves space-time and that gravity arises from the curvature of space-time. So we're redefining gravity here. Instead of saying it's a force, we're saying it's now a curvature of space-time. And remember we can use the rubber sheet analogy to think about the curvature of space-time and the fact that it's going to cause smaller masses that are passing close to that warped space-time to have their paths changed if they're moving slowly enough. Another thing you need to know is that light or a freely moving object follows a geodesic, i.e. the path with the shortest distance between two points in space-time. You should also be able to represent world lines for objects which are stationary, moving with constant velocity and accelerating. Know that the escape velocity from the event horizon of a black hole is equal to the speed of light, and any objects within the event horizon will need an escape velocity greater than the speed of light, which is not possible. And this is where a black hole gets its properties of trapping things inside it. Next it says to know that from the perspective of a distance observer, time appears to be frozen at the event horizon of a black hole. So remember time will slow right down near the event horizon of a black hole, but it becomes frozen when you reach the event horizon. Second last one says to know that the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole is the distance from its centre, i.e. the singularity, the centre point, to its event horizon. And lastly, use an appropriate relationship to solve problems relating to the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole. So you need to be able to use this equation, r Schwarzschild equals 2gm over c squared. Remember you can just write r subscript s for that to shorten it. Lastly we have section 3 which is stellar physics. And this says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems relating to luminosity, apparent brightness b, distance between the observer and the star, power per unit area, stellar radius and stellar surface temperature using the assumption that stars behave as black bodies. So we have our equation relating apparent brightness and luminosity, which is b equals l over 4 pi d squared, our equation for power per unit area, with Stefan Boltzmann's constant in it, so it's p over a equals sigma t to the 4, so we've got that fourth power of the temperature, and we've got our equation for luminosity in terms of the temperature, so that's l equals 4 pi r squared times sigma t to the 4. So remember these were some of our properties of stars that we looked at, so it's a good idea to be able to explain these properties as well. It then says to know that stars are formed in interstellar clouds when gravitational forces overcome thermal pressure and cause a molecular cloud to contract until the core becomes hot enough to sustain nuclear fusion which then provides a thermal pressure that balances the gravitational force. So this is looking at the formation of stars. It then says to know the stages in the proton-proton chain, PP chain, in stellar fusion reactions which convert hydrogen to helium. One example of a proton-proton chain is this one here, where we get a hydrogen molecule plus a hydrogen molecule goes to deuterium, which is hydrogen 2, plus an electron, plus an electron neutrino, and that would be stage 1. Stage 2 would be deuterium hydrogen 2 fusing with another hydrogen molecule to form helium 3 plus a gamma ray, and lastly stage 3 to form helium 4, we get a helium 3 molecule fusing with another helium 3 molecule caused by another reaction which has the first few stages of this process, which can fuse together to form helium-4, i.e. an alpha particle, you might recognise that from National 5 or Higher Physics, plus two individual hydrogen molecules which can go off and then do another stage 1. So this is how the sun, for example, undergoes nuclear fusion to burn hydrogen and then form helium. Next it says to know that Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams are a representation of the classification of stars, i.e. it's just a way of categorising or organising our stars. You also need to be able to classify stars and their position in Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams including main sequence, giant, supergiant and white dwarf. So you need to be able to point out where these four regions are on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and you should also be able to place stars based on their description whether they're cool or hot or dim or bright as to which region they would go in the diagram then says to use hertzsprung russell diagrams to determine stellar properties, including prediction of colour of stars from their position in an HR diagram. So again, that's kind of based on their description and what they might look like. So this is sort of doing the opposite to what we just said, where we're told that a star is in a certain region on the hertzsprung russell diagram, we should be able to work out roughly what its brightness, temperature, luminosity and colour and so on are going to be. Next it says to know that the fusion of hydrogen occurs in the core of stars in the main sequence of a hertzsprung russell diagram. And then it goes on to say that you need to know that hydrogen fusion in the core of a star supplies the energy that maintains the star's outward thermal pressure to balance inward gravitational forces. When the hydrogen in the core becomes depleted, nuclear fusion in the core ceases, i.e. stops. The gas surrounding the core, however, will still contain hydrogen. Gravitational forces cause both the core and the surrounding shell of hydrogen to shrink. 
In a star like the Sun, the hydrogen shell becomes hot enough for hydrogen fusion in the shell of the star. This leads to an increase in pressure which pushes the surface of the star outwards, causing it to cool. At this stage, the star will be in the giant or supergiant regions of our hertzsprung russell diagram. So this is now looking at our evolution of stars. It then says to know that in a star like the Sun, the core shrinks and will become hot enough for the helium in the core to begin fusion. And then another key point is to know that the mass of a star determines its lifetime. So it depends on the mass of the star as to whether it's going to become a white dwarf eventually, a neutron star or a black hole. So this links to the last point which says that the mass of the star determines its eventual fate. So we need to know that every star ultimately becomes a white dwarf, a neutron star or a black hole through its evolution, and the mass of the star determines its eventual fate. So for small mass stars similar to the mass of our sun, we will end up with a white dwarf eventually, whereas for stars of larger mass than the sun, we'll end up with a neutron star, and then for even larger masses of about 4 to 8 solar masses, we expect to get a black hole eventually. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video one of these, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.